Hello chemists, this is Ms. Placino and you are watching Screencast 2.3 on the behavior of electrons. In today's lesson we're going to discuss the behavior of electrons, namely if they behave as particles or as waves. It turns out the electron is an amazingly complex piece of matter that plays by a completely different set of rules than we're used to seeing um, in everyday life. Uh, let's take a look at the do now. Bohr's model of the atom only works for one element. Which element do you think it is and why? What does this tell us about his model of the atom? In the previous lesson, we discussed the Bohr model of the atom. So I'll just draw a Bohr model real quick. We've got our nucleus at the center of the atom, and then we've got these orbits where the electrons can exist. Electrons are not permitted to exist in between orbits because energy is quantized. Scientists really like this model. It's taken into account what was observed with the photoelectric effect, namely that energy is quantized, um, and it puts some very clear, easy to understand rules in place. The unfortunate thing about the Bohr model is that it only works for a single element. Any guesses? Hopefully you're thinking hydrogen. Hydrogen is the simplest element. It's got a single proton in this nucleus and one electron. It turns out once you start adding more and more electrons, you get to larger and larger elements, the Bohr model falls flat, and no longer can scientists mathematically explain the emission spectrum that are being observed. Basically, this tells us that the Bohr model of the atom is too simple. The behavior of the electron is much more complex than Bohr or any other scientist at that point in time had anticipated, so we're going to need to revise our model of the atom yet again. Uh, we're going to talk more about that model of the atom in uh, subsequent lessons. I just really want to focus on how the electrons are behaving. This is something that drove scientists crazy for a number of years. Louis de Broglie in 1924 proposed a theory that showed electrons as waves. Uh, so the electron itself is a particle, but it moves as though it is a wave. And basically, his, he, uh, because it behaves as a wave, de Broglie says that it is possible to know the exact location of an electron. Give you a little picture of what this model might look like. We've got our nucleus at the center of the atom, going over it in red. And then you've got an electron that's oscillating or kind of bouncing up and down like a standing wave. So I got my electron out here. It's orbiting and it's following that path, just up and down, up and down. And that's how it behaves. Uh, many scientists like this theory because wave behavior is well understood, and this does kind of clear up some of the anomalies um, that were present in the Bohr model. At roughly the same time, German scientist Werner Heisenberg came up with a theory that described the behavior of electrons as particles. Uh, so he says that electrons do not move like a wave, their movement is much more complex. Uh, so a wave, just that simple oscillating up and down, is not adequate when it comes to trying to describe the way an electron behaves. Um, to explain his theory, he used very, very mathematically complex matrices. Um, so complex that it confused a lot of other scientists. And one of his most noteworthy contributions is the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. You might have heard of this before. According to the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, it is impossible, so cannot be done, to know the exact speed and location of an electron. The more you know about one, the less you know about the other. And this is something that stands in stark contrast to what we're used to observing in everyday life. It is very possible to know your speed and your location simultaneously. Uh, so this was one that was difficult for scientists to understand and accept. Since we've got two competing theories, electrons behave as particles and electrons behave as waves, um, we needed to figure out who was right. So at this point in time, scientists conduct a very famous experiment called double slit experiments. Uh, so I've got a video to show you. Follow along with the notes in your workbook. And here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, Let's look at waves. 
The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern! We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter, through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So. They decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. First off, I just want to apologize for that creepy eyeball observer thing in the video. Hopefully that does not haunt your dreams. Um, second, I want to talk about the uh, the results of this double slit experiment. Really, scientists found out that the electron has that same wave particle duality that light has, and this is very confusing and very frustrating. Uh, so we've got two different models or two different views of the atom. Uh, this one over here is when uh, the electron is behaving more like a wave, and to the right we've got it behaving like a particle. 
In either case, you've got a pretty similar picture of the atom. So at the center, you've got a nucleus. I don't know how well you can see that being drawn in there. And then as you move farther and farther away from the nucleus, this cloud of electrons, again, whether you look at it in terms of electron being a wave or as a particle, gets less and less dense. It is OK to be confused right now. In fact, you've got a lot of company um, scientists at this point in time are also very, very confused. Um, so I want to read to you a short excerpt from Bill Bryson's A Short History of Nearly Everything regarding this wave-particle duality that we just learned about. As it was, the Europeans had their hands full trying to understand the strange behavior of the electron. The principal problem they faced was that the electron sometimes behaved like a particle and sometimes like a wave. This impossible duality drove physicists nearly mad. For the next dec decade, all across Europe, they furiously thought and scribbled and offered competing hypotheses. In France, Prince Louis Victor de Broglie, the scion of a ducal family, found that certain anomalies in the behavior of electrons disappeared when one regarded them as waves. This observation excited the attention of Austrian Erwin Schrodinger, who made some depth refinements and devised a handy system called wave mechanics. At almost the same time, the German physicist Werner Heisenberg came up with a competing theory called matrix mechanics. This was so mathematically complex that hardly anyone really understood it, including Heisenberg himself. But it did seem to solve certain problems that Schrodinger's waves failed to explain. The upshot is that physics had two theories based on the conflicting premises that produced the same results. It was an impossible situation. Finally, in 1926, Heisenberg came up with a celebrated compromise, producing a new discipline that, became, that came to be known as quantum mechanics. At the heart of it was Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which states that the electron is a particle, but a particle that can be described in terms of waves. This uncertainty around the th which the theory is built is that we can know the path of an electron the path an electron takes as it moves through space, or we can know where it is at a given instant, but we cannot know both. Any attempt to measure one will unavoidably disrupt the other. This isn't a matter of simply needing more precise instruments. This is an immutable property of the universe. What this means in practice is that you can never predict where an electron will be at any given moment. You can only list its probability of being there. In a sense, as Dennis Overby has put it, an electron doesn't exist until it is observed. Or put slightly differently, until it is observed, an electron must be regarded as being everywhere at once and nowhere. If this seems confusing, you may take some comfort in knowing that it was confusing to physicists too. Over by notes, Bohr once commented that a person who wasn't outraged on first hearing about quantum theory didn't understand what had been said. Heisenberg, when asked how one could envision an atom, replied, don't try. So we're definitely into a part of chemistry uh, that's really, really rooted in physics that is extremely confusing to all parties involved. And uh, if you take chemistry in college, you can take whole classes that are really just devoted to trying to shed some more light on this wave-particle duality of the electron and how it impacts our view of the atom. Don't worry, we're not going there in this class. You can't have a discussion on the wave-particle duality of an electron without discussing Schrodinger's cat. Uh, there's a video linked um, on the web page in case you'd like to watch it. I didn't want to put it in here. Schrodinger's cat is a thought experiment, so no one is actually performing this in real life. No one's putting cats in boxes, at least I hope not, not in the name of science anyhow. Um, according to Schrodinger's cat uh, thought experiment, you've got a box, you've got a cat in the box, and then you've got some device that could potentially kill the cat. In the picture we've got here, we've got um, like some type of poison. Uh, you can find other examples where there's an explosive or there's a radioactive substance, basically something that could potentially be deadly to this poor animal. And there's a 50-50 shot of the, let's go with an explosive, the explosive detonating. Now, until you look in that box to see if the cat is dead or alive, the cat is both dead and alive, according to quantum theory. And uh, this is something that is not really possible in the world that we understand. The cat is either dead or the cat is alive. It is impossible to be both at the same time, but that's exactly what's suggested by the wave-particle duality of an electron. Uh, so basically, inside the box, the cat is both dead and alive, and it isn't until you open the box where you force those different possibilities to collapse and the cat can only be one or the other. This is how we explain the idea that having an observer changes the behavior of an electron. So again, just to recap, you've got the cat in the box with something that could kill the cat. Until you open that box, the cat is both dead and alive. Um, once you open the box, it has to be one or the other. 
Uh, that's why looking at the electron, or this is analogous to looking at the electron or trying to observe the electron, changed the way it behaved in the double slit experiment. All right, so we hit you with some pretty complex and heavy stuff today. It is okay to be confused. I cannot stress that enough. Uh, for those of you who are already stressing out about the test, don't worry. I'm not going to ask you to explain the double slit experiment or explain the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. Uh, basically, the point of today's lesson is just to try to help you appreciate how complicated and bizarre the behavior of the electron is. Uh, really, I just want you to know that this small piece of matter that's fundamental and is found in really everything in the universe behaves by a set of rules that are completely different than the ones we are used to abiding by. Uh, we're going to take this crazy, crazy view of the electron and we're going to use it to uh, talk about the quantum mechanical model of the atom, which is the modern day theory or model of the atom that we still use today. So let some of this stuff sink in. Feel free to be frustrated and confused. That's completely okay. And hopefully we can clear up some of this confusion more in class. Thanks for tuning in.